Philosophers. Philosophers. Today, we're going to talk about something not so much off the cuff, but something that I feel people are starting to recognize. Or I think there's a problem that people are starting to recognize, or what they would consider to be a problem. And it might, at first, seem like a problem that is totally new, that is the result of technological advancement. And while the addressing of this problem isn't necessarily a bad thing, you can, I don't think there's any reason to discourage discussion. There is, it's the solutions that are being jumped to and proposed, even by those who may seem like they're on the side of freedom, or may, you know, that that commonly espouse the value of freedom, but they're jumping to conclusions that I think are unfair, and un, and then haven't been thought out well. And so, in and I would also like to point out that this may or may not be a problem that we haven't faced before either. And I think that there's just too much surface noise going on, but no one's taken the time to perhaps drill down on this. And so that's, I think, David, what I want to spend my time doing today, if that's okay with you. Sure. So let's uh, let's talk about that. So what what is uh, an example of an issue uh, like this and then uh, an example of a bad conclusion that's being jumped to? Okay. Right now, the the problem that the so-called problem that people are seeing is that there are private spaces on the internet. And when I say private, I mean privately owned, even though they are, in the largest sense, publicly accessible uh, in the form of social media. These areas that we find more and more people are engaging in what would be considered public discourse. And not just individuals, an average ordinary person or agent like you and myself, but government officials and those who supposedly have authority and that represent the public. The problem with this that is being pointed out is that these places are becoming what they would refer to as the new public forum or the public square. And for those who don't know, the public square is a concept that goes back quite a ways where there is a, and and you can still kind of see the physical implementation of this if you go to a town that was founded pre-1930s, but not even maybe that far back, but if you go to a, a, you know, they're usually smaller towns where you can easily see it. There's this square, and it's it's a literal square surrounded by roads that usually contains a courthouse or the center building, a, a town hall, what have you. And it's a, it's a literal square where it's a public space, and anyone can go there. I say this, in the United States anyway. And anyone can go there and say anything they want and address the people of their town or their locale. And you can say whatever you want here. You cannot be asked to leave for anything that you are saying. At at least that's the goal. It's the place where you can go and engage in the public dialogue. And you can bring issues as a common person in front of your peers, right? Or an example of another place like this historically might have been uh, like in front of the church. Um, depending on, you know, the, the size of the town you were in, or it was also common to, uh, to post bulletins on the door of the church and things like that. Exactly. These are places that every person has access to and that no one can be restricted from. Minor TM exception for, like, criminals, for example. But it, the, the average person in good standing could go here and they could see what others are saying, hear what others are saying, and say and respond to them in kind. And... This is the idea of the public square. Now, in the modern age, millions of people engage in dialogue now that aren't neighbors. And we see this as a good thing. David and I certainly, I think, would agree that this is a good thing. The ability to engage in discourse with anyone. 
that is willing to engage in it with you. Right. Well, and even especially with those whom you're not familiar with, um, because you know one of the one of the things that you know like if you look historically, like well, and I it, you don't even have to look that far back in history, um, you know when when communication over long distances or abroad was very slow and expensive. Um, basically, you had you had you know culture pockets uh, where where people you know all kind of thought alike. It, it, it was small towns everywhere. Um, everybody knew one another, and so then were therefore afraid to speak unorthodox opinions because then everybody would hear about it and ostracize them for it if they if they went against the orthodox um, most of the time. And so so the ability to engage with people you haven't heard of. Uh, before um, over great distances is great for for breaking the natural echo chambers that form when long distance communication is not possible right echo chambers formed by geography not by choice necessarily and then that way or, or by by easing choice you know so this presents a problem however that some are seeing that these pub these private companies that own these social media websites are being used in place of the public forum. And they see this as a problem primarily from censorship. For example, there is no reason a private entity cannot ban you for any reason most of the time from using their service. That's just common knowledge. They have the right to refuse as a private entity. Well, they see this as a problem because that refusal to be able to participate is essentially the same as you being banned in their eyes from the public square. And they have a bit of a point. I mean, because if everyone is going to a particular quote-unquote place to have their public discussions and you can't get there, then you have effectively been barred from public discussion you've been effectively ostracized yes right and they do have a point but they there's the the first conception is that this is the first time something like this has happened and in a way they are correct in a way this is the first time that as far as speech is concerned uh speech has been given a home that is private as opposed to public um the second thing is that, and is the assertion being made, the assertions, I should say, there are different proposals with how we address this problem. The most mild assertion that I hear is that we should create alternatives. If that is being used as the public square and you are barred or you don't like it, don't participate. Because if enough people cease to participate, it will no longer become the public square by essentially market forces now the issue with this is the one that david has already kind of alluded to this creates echo chambers where those who like what is being said will stay and form an echo chamber and those who don't will then form their own echo chamber elsewhere the echo chamber against the original echo chamber which you know that's how thought mobs work they and they will feed on each other from a distance, you know. And and there's a legitimate concern to be had there. The second solution to the so-called problem is something by way of a internet bill of rights, I've heard it called, or by... Long story short, we can lump all of these various solutions into government regulation. The government should step in and be involved in protecting the rights of the people to participate in the public space. And there's no clear way how to do that at this time, but that's the avenue they wish to pursue. The third way I have seen this addressed, and is the more extreme, is that we should just eliminate the ability for these private spaces to exist, and that it should be completely publicized or like made public and by that i mean 
the government runs social media sites. There will be well, no, it's not that they run sites. There will be one place essentially through which all. I guess that's, I guess that's what I mean. The government runs one or more platforms, right, for public discussion, and they assert their monopoly there and refuse the ability for others to exist. Those are kind of the three. Um, three primary camps of solutions that have been offered to this problem. So that's that's the groundwork I would like to start with. Um, I would like to start at the very core and address the nature that... Address the conception that this has never happened before. Um, to begin here, there is some merit to the to the argument that this is a new problem. Because it kind of is. There have been places like the like, that have served as public squares that weren't inherently public before. The good example that you've already given is the church. Churches have very... I, I don't think you could ever quite call them public. They may have been directly supported by the public to exist via tithing or some other method. But this is money that is freely given. Even if there are extreme social pressures to participate, I don't know that... You know, a lot of it was done through fiat. Like, you weren't forced... Well, I don't know. They probably could, not physically. Probably not physically. But also, um, you know, but just like these privately owned online spaces, the church had rules about what you were allowed to say at the church. Um, Anti-blaspheming laws and things of that nature. Or I don't know if you'd call them laws in that case. but Or if you're someone like Martin Luther and decide to just rail against the church, you know, there they, you know, there are serious uh, problems with that that they have. Right. Um, but there is a more recent example that doesn't necessarily have to do with speech, but I think that might cap- that might offer some glimpse into this problem further. I don't think that it has so much to do with speech. It's it's that it has to do with the public, the majority use um, and the majority demand. I, I want to point to the example of power or energy uh, as far as electricity is concerned. For those who don't know, and this is a very broad overview for which I'm not going to offer necessarily strict citation. However, I would encourage you to look at it your own if you are skeptical. Power companies or companies that produced electricity were not always publicly made public utilities. In in many ways, they were privately owned. And while there was plenty of like co-ops that were owned by cities or counties or maybe even a state, a lot of these were started and ran by private entities. And when the majority of people did not have access to electricity and electricity was new, these private companies built generators near the place that they wanted to provide power, and they were usually a lot smaller than they are now, and they would build them there and then they would, you could pay to have a power line ran to your house, and you could have power. Just you. Not everyone in your neighborhood, just you. Now, quickly, people banded together and went in on getting power for maybe their whole neighborhood or their whole village or whatever, what have you. It's a lot cheaper to run one line to the neighborhood and string offshoots to the different houses than it is to run individual lines and have people come out on different days, et cetera, et cetera. Exactly. And, and me being, say I am the individual who wants power the most, why would I bear the cost myself of running the line to just my house when it's just as easy to offshoot that line to each of my neighbors? Why don't I get them involved in and we all pitch in money to pay the power company to run it themselves? Or call a line company, which is not the same as the power company, to run the line between the two. And so that's how power generation was done. There were isolated pockets of places that had electricity and those who didn't. Now, this... During now, as electricity and the desire to have electricity became more common and more popular, there was a critical mass reached where the majority of the public wanted this. And there was a good reason that came about, at least in the United States, to make this public, and that was World War II. That's when you really saw this form into a public utility, and there was an agency created to oversee the to essentially make it 
access to this thing are right. Now, you don't get it for free, but you can demand access to it no matter where you are, and the company has to run a line to your house now. Because if they don't, the government will come knock on their door and, you know, make them do it. So, as... And this is one of FDR's alphabet soup. You know, th- actually, there were several different entities that were created. There was the... And then there was a chairman added to the cabinet. You know, the Department of Energy was created. And then there was the National Energy Regulatory Commission. And then the Tennessee Valley Authority. There were many different ones that, that popped up to regulate public utilities. And now all of these public utility companies essentially weren't private businesses anymore like they still are but it's an it's a it's a very highly regulated very touch and go relationship between private entities and government and that's how you get today where there is there still are pri- you when you get your electric bill it is a company it is not a public usually not a public utility but it's it's a company and you pay them for the power, but you did not. You don't have to request the power line be run to your house anymore. By default, when your house is built, the contractor who builds the home files that work on your behalf to have the power run to your house, and the, and the electric company has no choice but to serve you. And there's even regulations on price, for example, to make it affordable for each person. And it's so forced upon not just the uh, utility companies, but you as an individual almost can't own property without paying a utility either especially if you rent uh if i rent a piece of property i have to use a utility but for example the lease on the apartment i currently live in i cannot i will be evicted for not paying my power bill if i choose not to and even if i could survive without the electricity and i don't want it i have to pay for it you know and that's that's kind of how we got here and so there is this critical mass that happened it wasn't considered something that each person should have and that the government didn't have to man- didn't have to regulate until enough people wanted it and then these and then the government was essentially given authority from the people to 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 make it public to make this something that everybody should have right i think that's an interesting example of kind of what's happening with social media today no one cared about regulating social media until everyone used it and it was seen as important enough that we might need someone else to make them do what we want. And it's, and there are other areas in which this happened, and there are other industries that once you reach this point where you're so important and integral to the daily life and what is considered, you know, normal living condition, that you are deemed essentially a human right, as, the, as some would call it. And now you are and now the masses if you don't do what they want it's only a matter of time before they vote somebody into office that will take it from you and then do what they want you know and so this isn't necessarily a new problem it's just a problem that exists around something that is what we would consider to be a fundamental right or at least at first glance consider to be a fundamental right do you have anything to say on to further that point no, I think that's a good uh, a good analogy that you drew with the power companies, um, and you know it 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 it's a good illustration of how you know a, a lot of the things that that we have now that are considered public utilities were once things that it was just a regular thing not to have, and it was a luxury to have these things or a privilege to have. That that you know it it is if if you could afford it, you could have it. It's not that you deserve it; it's that I can afford it. Right. But we get these, uh, we, we have this, this meme in society of the standard of living, um, where, you know, as, as most people start to live, uh, under a particular standard, it's seen as, um, inhumane not to offer that to other people or even not to deliver it, the, the, the right. ultimate follow through. Yeah. So, there is a key difference, though, that I think needs to be called into question. When it comes to electricity and comfort, you aren't guaranteed comfort as a human right. I don't think any, while some may say that you are, I don't think any mainstream philosophical thinker 
ever has said that you that you have a right to live comfortably. Well, take this for example. There is a long-term power outage, which is not, uh, you know, let's say that it's not in a uh, place or a time of year in which this would be life-threatening to people. Uh, but you know, it's uh, it's getting a bit warm and everyone is miserable the whole time. Are these people's rights being infringed upon? No. No, you're uncomfortable, not. but it's not that. It's not the same as the Gestapo knocking down your door for, you know, speaking out against the Fuhrer. It's not the same because there's no human necessarily doing this thing to you, and or even, someone you know, irradiating your house with something that would would you know, make you know, it's not someone intentionally heating your house to make you uncomfortable. Right. It, and this is why a lot of when you, when you start discussing what is or isn't a right, the state of nature is usually invoked. Because in the state of nature, you would not have power anyway. However, in the state of nature, you also wouldn't have a person shooting a microwave at your house to make you hot. And you also wouldn't have people trying to stifle your speech either. For example, if you were alone. And so that's why you, I think these things are brought in. So, the I can already hear that the claims that this is different, though, because there is a human right that we that, that is underlying in this, and that is the right to freedom of speech. The claim would be that, well, I cannot speak to the public for without access to these sites, so it is different, and the government should be involved. To that, I have to say there are conf- there are people confusing the right of freedom of speech to the right to be heard. There's not the same thing. I have the right to say whatever I want, David, but I do not have the right to make you hear me. And I don't have the right to put what I have to say out in a way that you have to hear it. Or that, you know, that there that there has to be a way for you to be able to even hear it if you want You to. have a right to speak in the public square, but you don't have a right to summon people to the public square. Exactly. And so I think that's what's being confused here. So, for example, just if you did not have access to Twitter and you were a public official, an elected public official, and you need to be able to reach your constituents, it's not Twitter's job to ensure you communicate with them or to provide you a way to communicate with them. It is your responsibility to ensure that they hear you if you want if they want to hear you. And it's also equally their responsibility to make the effort to hear you as well. I think it's more their responsibility to hear you uh, and it's your responsibility to speak to them. But how that's facilitated is not guaranteed to you by any other person. And taking it back to the state of nature back when this was a, a lot more localized problem, it, it wasn't so much a problem. It, people were within walking distance of each other to speak to. And those that you weren't within walking distance to speak to, you just didn't speak to. Or you corresponded via letter. And that was what you had. And back in those days, too, most of the time you had to pay someone to ride the horse to carry the letter there. Before the U.S. Postal Service, for example. And you I still think, have to pay the postal service. And you, but you still have to pay the postal service. But I'm talking about before there was a public option. And there are still are private options in the form of couriers. But that's the thing. I think there's also they could make the argument from the standpoint of, well, there's the public mail service that provides. There should be a public email service, essentially, or something like that. And that's one area where, you know, I would disagree with it. But that's less invasive than making. It, it would be as though there was a private mail carrying some service before the postal service and the government took it over and said since you've already done all the work assembling the horses and the riders and the checkpoints we're just going to take this this mine now this mine now and it's called the u.s postal service and everyone's paying for it whether they use it or not right um you know and uh maybe maybe you were going to go here already um, I'm not sure. Not sure the uh, the path that you're taking with this, but um, the the thing with with email is that it's already pretty well distributed. It's not a, like a centralized service. Like there's not email incorporated that right. that runs this. You know, you have you have lots of different companies that provide email, and 
if one of them doesn't want to let you on, there is another one, and you can still email people from the first email platform. Right, but like if, if Google decides they don't like me and won't grant me an account, that's fine. If I, you know, I, I can sign on with somebody else and still send you a Gmail user an email, for example. Right, because the protocol is public and has been made available to everyone, and it's used out of convenience because the usability of email relies on its ability to be able to communicate with most everybody if not everybody who has email but this is different this is they will claim you know it's this is a centralized service and the most people are using it and if i don't have access to it i can't reach most of the people to which i would say you are not entitled to you do not have the right to speak to the majority if the majority doesn't want to hear you oh right or or, you know Maybe maybe there are some some technical reasons why this is totally unfeasible anyway. But let, let's let's imagine a world in which the universe was the universe. The internet is the same thing, right? It, it really is point, the same thing. At this point, the internet is the universe. the uh, The internet was never invented, um, and uh, and so our our fastest way to communicate is just old fashioned radio, right? Um, and you know. Because it's our, our fastest way, it starts to become a, a, a trend for people to set up their little, their own little personal radio stations to talk. Um, at some point, do people have you know some sort of a right to this? Like, no, you know, no, of course it's not. not. Oh well, you are now a citizen. Here is your radio. Here's your kit. government issued radio station so that right. you can talk around the country. Yeah. No, but but that's what's but the argument still being made is though that is the case. And I think it's flawed from the get-go. Now, now, after acknowledging... Well, okay. Before we move on to looking at these proposed solution camps, let's take one benefit of the doubt. Because I think there is one benefit of the doubt that is commonly taken here. And that is that, well, practically... And I will agree... And people would agree, maybe, that in a purely metaphysical sense... There is no right to this. However, there also isn't a right to power, but look at how we've benefited. And in this case, when it comes to discussing ideas and discourse, by not doing this, by not creating a space where everyone can communicate, we will foster echo chambers. And those echo chambers foster violence or they foster extremism. So it is a public service and a protection to provide a public space. And not only to provide a public space, but if you even then allow people to use their own private spaces, they can still form echo chambers. So we need to unify all this together for the sake of our safety. Which that's personally one of the oldest tricks in the book, in my opinion. If Think you, of our safety. If you, yeah, if you, the fastest way to erode someone's freedom is to make them feel like the eroding their freedoms will make them safer. That's, that's one of the oldest tricks in the book. Um, oh, there's a term for it, uh fear-mongering, you know. To this I have to say, my my assertion to this is that is essentially let them. So be it. You, If people want to become extremists, if people want to be in an echo chamber, whether it's because they're ignorant and don't know they're in an echo chamber, or they just consciously know that they don't like hearing certain opinions and want to be in an echo chamber for their own comfort, let them. The, you can't stop these people anyway. Even if you create one public space where everyone has to share it, they will find a way to block it out. Or they will move underground anyway. You know, a good example of this is the way people have been excommunicated, essentially, from these public services for being alt-right or being neo-Nazis. Actual neo-Nazis, not just people being falsely claimed as such, but people who are actual neo-Nazis. They still communicate. And you force them into an echo chamber anyway, and they're going to exist in that echo chamber where they're going to foster extremism, even if you didn't kick them off. Now they're for sure going to do it, but they could do it anyway. You know, their internet relay chat, I think, is where they are now, is what is commonly understood as, you know, that's a method by which they communicate, which, if you don't know what that is, it's essentially an ancient form of IM. Yeah, I'm calling it ancient. I don't care if you use it, David. David is also not a neo-Nazi TM. <laughs> I put that in there for legal reasons. Yes, uh, I, I well, I, I like to uh, I like to always cite the uh, the classic. I think it was uh, I think it was on that that TV show Numbers, 
uh, or, or something like that. One of those TV shows in which uh, they, they say that uh, that IRC is where all where all the pirates talk, and it's like you know it's like two ships getting together in the middle of the ocean to exchange a message, and it's all it's all very secret and sinister. Hold on, we're hacking into IRC. What do you hear? Yo ho yo, <laughs> pirates' life for me. But people will form echo chambers whether because they are comfortable. Regardless of if you eliminate the supposed ability, people will find a way. If they really want to be in these echo chambers, they will. And that's just, that's a part of being human. That's a part of, that's a, that's a problem on a social level. And you can't, I don't think, solve it by addressing a technological problem with a metaphysical answer as to who gets the right to do what. People will still they're going to find a way around it. And to that, I would say in a, in the, you giving you the benefit of the doubt in a utilitarian way, you in a utilitarian way, it will still come out to not being a solution. And you can't go from that to the metaphysical and say, ah, but in theory it would work. You know, if we go into the utilitarian scope as to why this should work, you had to, I think, remain there to prove that it will work empirically. And I don't see that it will. And I don't think, and even then, to further top that, you know, I think restricting the rights of people who wouldn't abuse a system because one person would abuse it isn't fair. You know, it, you can't punish a group for the sins of a single person. You know, it doesn't matter what it is. That's, you can't do it that way. That's, I think, awful. You know, I, I think most people would agree. You know, for example, David... You being a person who's wear, who wears hats, if I find that there's alarming data that most hat wearers are murderers, and for that reason we restrict your ability to own a knife or a gun, and you are put on a watch list just because you wear a hat, that's not right. It doesn't matter because you haven't done those things, at least to, to my knowledge. Um, but you see what I'm saying? You know, taking a characteristic, even if empirically it shows there are, there's a causal trend for some reason or what appears to be a correlating trend. That's a, I need to not confuse those words. Um, it doesn't matter. You can't take actions against a person who has done no wrong in that way. So that's what I have to say to that. I don't know if you want to address that contention. Well, I'm just trying to withhold a uh, uh, joke about tinfoil hats. Anyway, ah, nice. It is not tinfoil, I will say that, um, for those who are listening terrestrially, even though we don't stream this uh, with video. But anyway... So with that all being said, let's. I think it's worth our time to examine the three solutions that they offer and why I don't think they're a good idea. And so, oh, if you've already gotten this far, I think it's pretty obvious that I'm opinionated and I'm not going to be truly objective necessarily here. You opinionated? Biased? Yeah. Sue me, but please don't. Um... See you in court. For legal reasons, that was a joke. <laughs> so the the first camp is the folks who say, well, it should just be left alone. Like, it doesn't matter if it's... The, they're the people who've already kind of gone with the same train of thought I have. And that is that, well, it should just be left alone and that you can't regulate a private entity and at the very least you offer a, a public option along, along with... The private options. Do not ban the private option. Don't ban the don't ban the private options. Just offer a public version. And and, and this is I think, at least as far as what we would consider to be normal, probably the best solution. Within the bounds of what is realistically likely to happen, because for example the the postal the postal service still exists even though it is outcompeted. Outcompeted. Yeah hand over foot by every other parcel major parcel service out there they can do it cheaper faster with more accuracy and offer you way better features but it still exists as an option because that is the way the government uses that is the method by which the government uses to contact its citizens that's the only reason i think the postal service still exists um even though things like amazon has its own courier service there's ups fedex dhl you know those are the main ones, but there are plenty other, I'm sure, at least in the United States. Um, they exist as a private option that you can use if you so choose. There you go. And if you're banned from those, then you can use U.S. Postal Service. 
which I don't see any reason why you would be banned from those, but that's besides the point. The second camp is the camp that would say the government should intervene to assume control and impose regulations on these industries, much in the same way they did with power companies. Let them exist as private corporations, but with heavy government regulation, with no need to provide a public option. I don't like this solution because, at all, because, well, government regulation, but because now, you have to keep in mind, at least in the United States, the government exists and makes rulings based on supposedly the majority you know if a majority of people want it a certain way they will vote people into office to do it the way they want or at least what they think will be the way they want right so while you might think i'll get my way today if the public opinion changes no matter what it is in favor of restricting more rights or in favor of generating more leniency the system will change to reflect it, or it supposedly will. Or in the case of a government bureaucracy, it will exist outside of all of those things, and you won't get a say either. Long story short, no one's going to be happy. There will always be people who think it's too much and people who think it's too little. And all the while, I don't think nothing will fundamentally change except for people being removed from these places anyway, but being done... but being removed by threat of violence, essentially now. Because the government can just come at you with a gun if they don't want you doing something a certain way. And you see this happening in countries like the UK right now, where police are used to police what is said on social media sites, even though... Or at least to intimidate, even if they don't bring legal action against these people. Exactly. I think right now they have a... What is it called? A... Not a conference, but a commission an interview they they want to conduct an interview with you about your social media usage and you can guise it as a way of trying of them trying to educate people on why they are wrong but even then i don't know about you but i don't always trust the government to know what's right and what's wrong and to tell me what is right and what's wrong you know and i don't think i should impose that on anyone else if i wouldn't want it imposed on me yeah, well, it's not like we don't have historical precedent for uh, badness happening when the police go around handing out opinions. Exactly. You know, and, and for those who would say, well, but they would agree with what I say, so it's fine. I, I don't personally suffer for this. Yeah, for now. For now. You know, a good example of this happening, you know, pe- most people don't know the Gestapo or the secret police in Nazi Germany, they were mainly focused on policing ideas and thoughts it wasn't that they were necessarily looking for the juden you know as they would say or the jews and trying to get them out it's that they were they were targeting their own citizens for thinking wrong or for thinking against the reich and what the nazi ideology was and so they were targeting their own citizens and while at the beginning and so if you know imagine the united states becomes one of these states where you now disagree too bad you know you've already signed on to this program and they're going to knock at your door and tell you things that you think are wrong i think a better example than the gestapo is the the um the uh oh who who were the who were the similar secret police in communist russia the kgb yes the kgb um i think that's a better analogy because because the way that it started was you had the what was decidedly the public opinion by way of revolution um, being enforced uh, by by police. But then if you if you read anything about it, you see how this, this starts to spiral out of control, at where people who are associated with people who are associated with people who had you know a, a bad dream one time uh, start getting arrested and sent to the gulag. Um, right, you know, and and. Right, so we, and, we we have we have history, we have precedent here of of how you know the, the like the KGB probably originally existed with the purpose of enforcing the will of the people, you know, of uh, you know trying trying to bring 
these these good ideas on on the public, you know, and and right. getting rid of those who who were against the people. Sure. And then as these good ideas, and, and people were elected into power, elected people were put into power. I guess you could say somewhere by election, but I mean it's kind of a moot. I actually point. don't know how the communist government got started after I don't revolution. either, but I do know that the popularity amongst the citizenry was really high at first. So if if it was by election, they would have won in a landslide. If they just took control because of revolution, most people were fine with it. Well, the people that you put in place that hold the same ideals as you are probably going to be way more zealous about those ideas. And if you watch zealotry happen, they then take the idea to its next conclusion and then the next conclusion. And they keep going down the thought path and then they'll go, they oftentimes will go down a path where you don't follow because you disagree. Well, it's it's because the goal is so vague that you don't know when you're finished. Right. And so now you know you might find yourself supporting this being done against people uh, that you would have disagreed with at the beginning but now that you know you you got to the point where you're okay to stop you're like okay this is where i want it to stop you can't stop now those who have the authority to just keep going unchecked and so you find yourself in the other now and uh, the overton window shifts and you become the target because you're now outside the Overton window as far as what's considered acceptable thought. And so, and it doesn't matter what that ideology is, you know, that's, it, we've provided two examples, one fascistic and one socialistic, and there are those who say that they're practically the same thing. It's the methods of authoritarianism that were the same, the beliefs were different, you know. But you can apply this to any belief system. You, know, you can apply it to a religious belief system in the form of an inquisition or a jihad. You can apply it to any political system as well, you know. And so that's what I have to say to those in the second camp that we just take over the private entity and just regulate them into the ground. And not only that, but you, you'll find, and this is one thing that's puzzling to me, is that these private corporations are almost asking for it. And I understand why. And it's because policing content or the thoughts of millions is hard. If you look at the data on the sheer number of tweets and Facebook posts and whatever else that go out per day, you cannot hire enough people to look through all of them. And while they're looking for a technological solution, there we haven't gotten to that point yet. Like there's not a good algorithm for determining what's good or bad and there's going to be damage done either way, either by not doing it far enough or by going too far. And so it's almost as though they're reaching out to ask for this help because they believe that the government can marshal the forces to do this and they might be able to but not in the way you know that the the opinions and the mindset of those in power will not especially in the united states do not change at the same pace of those in the public sphere and don't ever adequately represent the true diaspora of opinion take so, for example the fcc the fcc exactly. and, and the things that they feel that they need to suppress in popular media Exactly. Um, Because there are things, well, if we take it back to the 80s, they, you know, there was a large overlap between what was considered by the majority Christian population as obscene, and those things were regulated. And And TV channels like MTV made their hay on playing the line on just inside what was considered, you know, what was really edgy at the time. And now it's almost as though it it's flipped entirely, but that change didn't happen at the same rate as the commonly accepted public opinion, you know. So I guess long story short is alienating the solution from the people like that I don't think will ever yield an adequate response. And that brings us, I think, to the third camp of solutions, and that is we should just get rid of it altogether and just make the public option the only option. I think it has the exact same effect as the last solution. It just happens much faster. And there then will be oppression not only in the form of policing the content, but now you are oppressing people by restricting even further the access to the diversity of what would be created. You know, like for example, today there are the giants, the, the Twitter and Facebook. And Instagram, which I think is owned by Facebook. But Twitter and Facebook and their subsidiaries are the 
vast majority of where social dialogue takes place on the internet. But they're not the only ones. There are plenty of alternatives that do already exist, and they exist as microcosms in and of themselves of maybe different, you know, political opinion, but they exist, you know, and people have a place to go if they don't like it, you know, and, and you still have the freedom of choice. In the government regulation on what already exists, you still have the freedom of choice, but the person you're engaging with or the entity or private business you engage with now has a restriction on their freedom of what they're able to provide. The third is the ultimate restriction where you lose your ability to choose and you lose your ability to, to negotiate what you're willing to accept or not as what's reasonable. You know, we've, ha we've talked a lot about what the reasonable person considers and how you can't get a good beat on what that is. If there is only one option, you know, for you to go to it, you it doesn't matter you know they get to decide what is reasonable you don't get to negotiate that um a good example is like gab.ai right now is a t very similar to twitter alternative where that has much different terms of service and you can choose to engage with them if you disagree with some parts of the twitter terms of service and you don't have to use them but if you look at their terms of service and say you know what i believe about the whole concept of being able to engage over the internet lines up better with these people, I'll engage with them. Or at the most extreme, if you have the skill or you have enough people and you're willing to crowdfund up an alter, another alternative, you can still do that. And I know some people will say, well, that's not really a good solution either because you still don't have the majority of people on your side. Well, that's just the market, you know. You can't make these people come use your site unless you're the only one, like the government. But it's much better, I think, to give people the freedom of choice in that case. And so I guess, you know, that's what I have to say about the third campus. It's pretty much, it's just, it's worse than the last one, but the effects will seemingly be the same, except worse. <laughs> um, yeah. I tend to agree. Now, what this does leave us with is essentially a scenario where we disagree with a assumption about the problem. We disagree, and ultimately we disagree with there being a problem, I think. Or at least the problem as stated. I think that there is a problem, but it is not a problem that should, or even really could, be addressed by involving an authoritarian regime. Or any government. Um, so let's let's take a step back in what time we have left, and look at what I think may be the real problem. And I could be wrong about this, so you know I'm sure David, you'll chime in, and anyone who's listening who thinks that I'm missing the mark can let me know or let us know too, because this is something that we're kind of just you know feel, feeling out. Um, I think the real problem has to deal with what is is the human inability to digest social input on this scale. For example, human beings biologically are able to interface with and communicate with quite a large group of human beings simultaneously in the real world. You know, if you look at the feats of engineering and marvels in the world that have been built, like the pyramids, the Sphinx, the, the Great Wall of China, and you know, even things not even nearly as big as that, it took thousands of people over generations cooperating to do those things. And human beings are one of the most social species that exist and that have ever existed outside of you social insects, but that's a different topic. It's, it's a little different for us. Um, but we're able to communicate with quite a few people on a subconscious, and when I say subconscious, I mean like a body language level, but also on a speech level. But I don't think it was ever meant to be scaled up to you and also the vast sums of pretty much everyone else that exists. I don't think it was ever meant to go that high. And we definitely, I don't think, have, cap have the capability to do that. And if you don't believe me, Get in a Twitter get in a Twitter battle with five people and keep track of that. 
good luck. You know, try people that are just as engaged as you. It's really hard to keep track of five conversations at once, much less, you know, two, you know. And... Right. Yeah, it's it's not it's not that having a conversation with five people is hard because people do that all the time. You know, you go out with your friends, sit around a table and have a have a conversation with, you know, maybe even more than five people at the same time. The thing is that it's all synchronous. On Twitter, it's asynchronous. So exactly. you get to keep up with all these things happening in parallel in real time. And and not only that, but if let's let's take the synchronous example of the five people you got to dinner with. Let's take the there's one topic you're all you are all discussing, and there are two people participating in the discussion at first. It's you and me. The number of people you have to iterate through to hear everyone's opinion and response is on the order of the number of people you have. So it's just, I assert, you respond, I respond, you respond, and it goes back and forth. Now, so there is essentially two responses per each round. You add a new person. It's not that there are three responses necessarily, because now that third person can address you, your response, and my response. So now there are eight. No, I'm sorry. Is it eight or four? I forget the formula for how it's going to go, I'll be honest. Uh, I'm not, I'm pretty burnt out. But, so each person, there are three, gets two responses, so six. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, six. okay. Yeah, it's it's very similar to the common, it's combinatronics, essentially. Uh, so now there are six. So if we had a fourth person, there are three responses per each person. So three times four is 12. Now there are 12, essentially, packets of dialogue that had to be exchanged per round. You add a fifth person, each person gets four, now there are 20. You, and it goes up higher and higher and higher as you, as, you, as you go. You scale that up to the size of the human race that is alive and using Twitter, you can't make it through one round in a person's lifetime hardly if you assume it takes 30 seconds to formulate a response for each person, or you, each person's allotted 30 seconds to respond. You can't get through that many people, you know. So there, there's a human limitation going on here, and I think... I don't. I would begin to almost question the use of having this ability. I think it's good that we have the ability to communicate with anyone, but when you look at how Twitter is structured, it's it rewards popular dialogue. You know, I can look up a hashtag and see what see and respond to any person who's used that hashtag or responded to someone using that hashtag. And that hashtag could be just a basic assertion, or a tied to a basic assertion, and see a wealth of responses. And so each person's getting their chance asynchronously to say what they think about that topic. In order for me to read through them, I have to do that many iterations. And then if I were to respond, I'm adding another one onto each of those. And it's it's too much. I think, And but there are people, I don't think it's an efficient way to engage in a dialogue, necessarily. But what it is a good way to do is get the, what the at least perceived opinion of the public is. You can generally gauge the response to what someone has to say by looking at the likes on it. Or the ratio, as they call it, of likes to retweets to comments. Um, so if, essentially you assume that a retweet is someone that agrees exactly and would say the same you would see someone who likes it as someone who generally agrees. So those are both positive. And then you see comments as negative generally. So if you look at the ratio of what you would consider a negative figure to the positive figures, you can kind of get an idea of how the general public feels about a topic. And people willingly give this feedback, you know. For a government or for any, like for businesses, sure, this is a great way to focus test just small snippets of information into the public and not have to pay them because <laughs> people will for free tell you what they think because we love to tell people what we think but as far as engaging in public dialogue it's not a dialogue really you can engage in dialogue with another person or maybe a couple people on a topic that you would not normally have the ability to communicate with but as far as the whole public it's not the same you know, which I guess you can make the argument that it was never the same anyway, because the one person standing in the public square, you know, speaking to the crowd 
can't address the concerns of each person in the crowd either. You know. Right. He's not engaging in a dialogue either. He's giving a presentation more or less. Right. And and I think but that's how we did things and, and there's I think there's there's some sense to that. Let me speak and give my idea, right? If someone doesn't agree with the idea, don't interrupt. Let the person finish. And then when it is your turn, you get up and then you speak your idea about what they've said. And it's slow, but people... The, the idea of a caucus is here. And that's where people will literally move from one side to the other based on how they feel about what is being said or whether or not they're in agreeance. In Twitter, you don't have that. You have the ratio, which is essentially the same thing. But this all going on within a private space, it's no different really than the limitation we had before where if you're excluded on purpose or you're excluded by your inability to, your inability or lack of interest to be involved in Twitter because I mean, if we really look at it in reality, Twitter does not affect reality any more than dialogue would in a public square would, and actually probably less so, because if it's something we're discussing in a local town hall meeting, I know I see these people every day, you know, and I can see small changes happening, but something on such a grand scale, even if it did have an effect, that effect is then spread out over the same scale, and so with each unit is seemingly infinitesimal you know um so i don't know I, I i don't i think it's not even really a problem personally um both util in a utilitarian way and in a metaphysical way it's not a problem for people to be excluded from these places and i would say for those who would make the argument that well my public official is on twitter and i need to be able to tell them as a constituent what i want there's a service that is run by the government for you to tell your official what they think. It's called the post office. It's called the post office, or how likely is it you're going to get banned from every email provider there is? They read emails. Sure. And How and likely is it that you're going to be denied phone service? You can call them. There's a way. There is a way. And that's also assuming your representative cares enough to do it. In reality, they probably have an intern do all that and then give them the broad strokes. But such is the limitations of a government as a republic. You know, I, I don't, I honestly don't see it as a problem. I really don't. And I think while people don't like it, by fighting the, fighting the wrong problem will make things worse. And not only will it make things worse, but... If you disagree with the behavior, I mean, spoiler alert, no one makes you use any social media outlet. Oh, but it's the place where everyone's talking. Well, you're a part of the problem then if you don't like that because you use it and you communicate on it. And not only that, but you don't have to just use that, you know, go somewhere else and talk too. And if someone cares enough to hear your idea, you know, they'll go there. Because it's, it's amazing how not inconvenient it is to hear someone's idea. It's really super convenient these days. But it's almost as though we complain that it's still not convenient enough. Because, oh, it's not enough that I can show my idea to anybody. They have to have a way to see it where they look, you know. It's almost as though a person in Arkansas wants to communicate their message to those in New York. So they, they, there has to be provided a billboard for them to put up their idea in New York where the people they want to reach. Or, or if we, you know, go, uh, you know, with the, the example of the, uh, of the public square, like you have a right to a plane ticket out there to go give your opinion on the public square. Right, and you don't. And so I think I think really if you, if you if there is any problem, if there is any problem, it's that we as a society or people take these things too seriously. Or people I I think it's absurd that people make personal life decisions based on what happens on social media. And that's a personal problem. That's not 
a public health problem or a public concern. That's a personal problem. If you have to have access to what someone else has to say, because otherwise you'll be negative affected in your personal life, I think that's honestly just a lack of culpability on your part. I, I'm i sorry. And that might be offensive to some people, but it, I think it's the truth. You know, if you, and I think there's data to back that up, especially when you look at all these people that get off of social media and then their lives improve or their mental health improves for a while and then they get back on and it tanks again. Why would you willingly expose yourself to something that makes you sick like that? And don't be wrong, I will support your right to be able to do that. But why would you want to? Like, what's the point? What are you getting out of this? You know, I've got to know. Why? Why do you have to know everything? I think, you know, and I think there's a culture shift that occurred as well where people don't go looking for what they want to know anymore. They expect to be shown what they want to know. And that's a technology problem. That's a real technology problem because we build the internet and especially a lot of these search algorithms to try and show you what we think you want to see, you know. But that's a pretty big, that, that's, I think, more of a real problem than, oh, I need to see it, you know, and it's your fault if I don't, or I have to have someone provide this to me, and I have to be provided to others. So I think that's what I, I, I have to say about it. And I think there's more to be said. I, I don't know. I, I feel like there are others that maybe have other opinions on this as well. I'd like to hear, because... All I'm hearing is people talking about this is the problem, this is how we got to fix it. But there's been no validation on that it is a problem. And there's been no validation is in my eyes that it is that important. And I don't want to call these people out as in doing this intentionally, but it is a common debate tactic to skip, to quickly move to your solutions if you can't prove that it's a problem to try to distract others from addressing the core concept as an issue altogether. So I don't think that maybe this is done in, intentionally and in foul, but, you know, I, I definitely think that it might be, I think there might be people jumping way too ahead instead of addressing the core issue. That's all I, that's, that's kind of what I wanted to talk about with this whole episode. In fact. Yeah, I see where you're coming from. Um, I, I think that, um. I, I think it's true that uh, th th this seems to be a personal problem people have, and pe people are getting attached to their uh, their outrage machines because that's what they are at this point as well. That's another thing we 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 didn't talk about the the outrage culture and how how people are, are going looking to get upset by things. The vindication machine. Yes. Um, you know, I uh, I made a personal decision a while ago not not to use these things anymore, and. I'm fine without it. I don't feel that I am, you know, losing my, you know, freedom to express my opinions or anything like that. Um, you know, I, I still have ways to get my, to get my voice out if I want to, um, and and it it doesn't involve uh, playing their game. Exactly, and you know, this also kind of alienates the point of an idea. That I think this also alienates this this doesn't this fights the alienation from ideas from the person speaking the idea as well you know because if you have a good idea and you don't use any of these social media sites it'll still spread people will still pick it up people will still use it it may not be as fast but at some point someone who does engage in those things will put it out there you know um i don't know the statistic but i have a good feeling that a majority of memes and I mean this in like the, the you know, kekken memes out there these days, most probably originate in like maybe a private group chat as a joke. And then someone thinks it's funny and thinks it's applicable enough to put out. And then it goes through the Tumblr of, and I don't mean like the website Tumblr, it goes through the, you know, physical, I'm not even going to use the term anymore because that, that just put a bad taste in my mouth. It goes through the crucible that is the internet meme machine and then comes out in its prime form like a virus and spreads, you know. But they're not cultivated there. And I think most of them are actually cultivated in, as inside jokes that then spread, you know. And so, I don't know. Just another, you know, a little bit of thought. You know, if the idea is good enough, it'll get spread regardless because that's what we do as people. If we hear a good idea or something we like, 
or more specifically something we hate, we'll spread it. So social yeah. media or not, uh, uh, the case can be made that actually, if you have a good idea, um, that it might not be the best idea to go share it on a popular social medium because uh, if you if you share it in somewhere that's more say conventional, you're a lot less likely to have uh, somebody uh, you know heckle you out of being taken seriously. Right. I think maybe there's another topic in there for us to discuss. I think we should separate the topic of outrage culture and discuss that. Maybe not next week, but in a separate video or podcast. Okay. Um, but until then, philosophers. Philosophers.